Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 33rd Surface Ventures webinar. I see a few of you have already said hi in the chat, but for the rest of you, can you please say hello? Tell us where you're joining from. We always love to, uh, to see that. My name is Dr. Sam McMaster. I'm the event manager here at Surface Ventures, and we are a non-for-profit organization, and our mission is to provide world-class material science education for both academia and industry. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Min Zhou of the University, University excuse me, of Arkansas. Uh, Dr. Min Zhou is a distinguished professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Arkansas. Her research focuses on nanoscale surface engineering, nanomechanics, and tribology for a wide range of applications. She's a fellow of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, uh, known some as ASME and a fellow of the Society of Tribologists and Lubrication Engineers, STLE. She served as the chair of the ASME Tribology Division Executive Committee and a chair of the STLE Annual Meeting and Exhibition. Many thanks to today's partner, Data Physics Instruments. We'll have a short presentation from Daniel Schultz, who has said hello in the chat later in the event. We'll also be releasing poll questions and handouts from Data Physics Instruments throughout the event. I'll keep you updated in the chat when we're releasing these. As we go along uh, throughout the presentation, please uh, type your questions into the chat and they'll be marked for the Q&A session at the end of the event. We're planning to go for around 60 minutes today in total, and we'll be sharing a link uh, to an attendance certificate that you can generate for yourself later in the event. So without further ado, let's welcome our speaker to the stage and proceed with the webinar. So, Professor Zhou, can you uh, please come on stage? Thank you much, uh, Sam, uh, for the nice introduction, <laughs> and thank you, uh, Surface Ventures, for the uh, kind invitation. Uh, let's um, let me share my screen. Of course, so I'll that... just stay on stage to to verify that we can all see that, and then I'll I'll leave stage to let you begin. Okay. Oops, ah, I think you've accidentally come off stage again, but that's okay. <laughs> there you go. It's okay. Don't worry about it. It's okay. All right. Okay. Okay, fantastic. I can see your screen. Uh, okay, so uh, today I'm going to talk about bio-inspired surface engineering for tribological applications uh, with an emphasis on uh, surface micro nano topography engineering. Um, I guess the audience of Surface Ventures may be uh, familiar with uh, surface engineering. It's very uh, mission critical for many industries. Uh, for example, automotive, aerospace, transportation, and mining industries. They have a lot of moving components and uh, you want those components to last long, uh, maybe uh, have low friction also to save energy. Also, um, besides, you know, th those are traditionally is coatings or surface treatment. Uh, also, another type of surface engineering is a topography engineering. You can see those surface textures or, or grooves or, or, or different patterns engineered on the surface to control the traction um, between the car and road and, of course, and bicycles and, and so on. So those are actually larger scale textures. Uh, when it comes down to smaller scale, uh, you could also find um, a lot of machine components has textures uh, in different lubrication regimes. For example, in hydrodynamic lubrication regime, you can help uh, uh, lift the surface apart in the elect uh, elasto hydrodynamic regime, you actually generate a little bit thicker film and then uh, if you are in a starved lubrication regime, it can help, texture can help retain lubricants. And of course, um, textures sometimes can capture the wear debris as well. Uh, even in dry contact uh, lubrication uh, conditions, surface texture can reduce texture cont um, surface contact area and then you reduce friction and friction. So those are the key uh, functions behind the surface texturing. 
there are uh, patients already benefited from um, surface texturing success stories, including the, the uh, in the car engine, there's piston ring and cylinder liner interface, where uh, cross-hatched textures are um, placed in on the surface of cylinder liner uh, through um, honing. Uh, those are not uh, I guess random random uh, cross hatch, but they generate already a, a benefit in terms of being able to keep lubricants inside the, the groups of those uh, patterns and then lubricate uh, the piston ring and liner interface. Uh, also, lately there are uh, some applications in of textures on mechanical face seals and journal bearings. And then even smaller devices uh, like computer hard drive, where uh, increasing recording density uh, requires super smooth disk and uh, read-write head, where you can see this read-write element getting closer and closer to the disk, uh, which requires uh, them to be both to be smooth and that smooth surface cause high stiction between the recording head and uh, recording media. Uh, laser textures, uh, those small texture bumps that can help reduce the contact area between head and, and disc to uh, therefore reduce uh, interface stiction and friction. And when we get even smaller micro electromechanical systems uh, uh, they are also, not only surface are smooth, but also the structure are small and very close to each other. Uh, in, the, in those cases, the adhesion or stiction is a big issue, both during process and during application, where you can see here, there is a RF MEM switch supposed to be turned on and off uh, when the voltage is applied, but really because of the smooth surface, uh, when it turned on and it never bounced back. So also the small device tend to run fast because uh, they don't have traditional uh, inertia. Uh, uh, traditional force is not in play. So they run fast and they wear very fast also. With those devices, it's hard to uh, make an interface that it can slide against each other without any stiction or wear friction issue. So it's important to engineering surface topography on those devices to enable new applications. Uh, and those textures often require micro scale or even nano scale. Um, however, fabrication, uh, fabricate those small textures may not be very easy. Uh, different method has been tried, uh, including lithography, you know, those photolithography, which generates a little bit larger textures, and e-beam lithography, and can generate very small structures in a nanoscale. Also, laser has been used also, as well as uh, soft lithography. You can make a pattern, texture pattern, and then mold it and copy it. Uh, self assembly is another one. You, know, you, you know, allow nature to assemble the texture by themselves. But lately, there is an emerging technology called 3D nanoprinting, where you can actually focus a, a laser, like a football shaped uh, voxel, focus energy in that area and to cross link polymers to harden them. And then uh, if you move the laser in 3D space, you can make three no, textures or 3D structures out of it. So this is a promising technology to fabricate any shaped uh, textures, as opposed to uh, some of the photolithography technique or even lithography, you can only make uh, essentially 3D, but it's not truly 3D, it's two and a half D, uh, essentially means it's actually a 2D shape, but protrude um, in a 3D, uh, in Z direction. Uh, so my, my lab mainly focused on advanced surface engineering. We incorporate nanomaterials, uh, surface coatings, and surface micro nanotopography into the surface. 
and hopefully generate uh, a variety of services for different applications and we uh, have a, a few technologies being commercialized. So today I'm going to talk really focus on um, surface topography engineering that inspired from nature. Uh, there are a variety of things that we can learn from nature, but for tribologists, for mechanical engineers, we often uh, care about the surface that can reduce friction, enhance mechanical property and, and, and application associated with that. So I'm going to give some examples here. Um, but uh, before we can really mimicking nature, uh, we have to think about how are we going to do it? Because nature surface are very complex. Uh, you could have surface with a variety of different topographies and also chemically they are different too. And then uh, surface chemistry, uh, chemistry as well as materials heterogeneity, meaning uh, they don't have the uniform uh, same materials throughout. Uh, furthermore, they are self-renewable. If you make a scratch to a surface, they, they can heal by themselves. Uh, but man-made uh, materials, uh, I know that there are research uh, towards those directions also, but it's um, very complicated to duplicate exactly uh, what nature has to offer. So we have to think about how do we simplify uh, the nature surfaces. What are the key features that uh, are desired for certain functionality that we are looking for? And also, can we combine uh, features from different species so that we can come up with properties that uh, is new and novel and probably better than the nature surfaces? Uh, so there are uh, several big challenges one of them being you know, durability you know, if we can make the surface can can they last long uh, the other is can we fabricate any surface topography we want because we know that you know, the nature there existed all, all sorts of surfaces can we duplicate them or, or fabricate any surface uh, so first challenge is durability um, here we show that we can kind of duplicate surface. Here is a, a lotus leaf surface. We can more or less duplicate the features, but after one scratch or after a few scratch or, or after loading, uh, those uh, textures are deformed. Uh, so similar here too. Uh, here we use more idealized uh, patterns that that's also deformed. Uh, I, this is an attempt I did you know, at the beginning is just use evaporation of metals, even metals when you subject to a scratch smears. So those are the durability issues. Um, but we can learn from like seashells from nature, right? So seashells, first of all, it has a curved surface structure. And also if you dissect it, right, uh, cross section it, you will see the, the shell, uh, seashell structure is it's layered structure with hard and soft layer in between uh, layers. So this kind of structure make it both now, now the, the curved structure help distribute the stress evenly um, in on, on the structure and this microstructure helps actually increase the toughness. Uh, of the material. So both be strong and tough. Uh, make, make. So if you drop a seashell on, on the floor, it won't shatter like ceramics. It, it's hard, uh, but it's not tough. So you can shatter a, a cup, a ceramic cup uh, on the floor, but not the seashell. So that's something we, we can learn is to be able to now have this core shell structure where inside is some tough material like aluminum here uh, and outside is a, a amorphous silicon shell which is somewhat brittle but uh, it's hard uh, and also we form this curved structure uh, this makes this core shell structure super strong and we can also actually uh, extend this idea to polymer core and also um, uh, aluminum shell 
I'll give those examples here. Uh, in this case, uh, this aluminum core and amorphous shell, I use a nano indenter diamond tip to actually indent on individual uh, particles. Without the shell, you can see the aluminum dot only, it's actually fractured, uh, even though it's a ductile material, but it's fractured uh, under high indentation uh, force. Actually, it's not high compared to what I apply to the uh, core shell structure, uh, but core shell structure, we don't see any change. Um, here, more interesting is that during loading, this is a load and load curve. So during loading, I apply increasing load where you see deformation introduced, but also we see this pop in that's typical of plastic deformation. However, after I release the load, uh, those actually popping actually popped out, meaning they actually were uh, atomic movement introduced during loading within the uh, core actually move back. And then uh, when the load is completely released, it's the, the uh, deformation come back to zero, meaning I don't see a net change in the um, shape of the uh, nano dots. So this actually is very high contact pressure of a gigapascal, more than 20 gigapascal. Uh, also, we scratch the surface without shell. Um, this one was done using a kind of random uh, with different sizes. Uh, we discovered this phenomenon, so we said we got to study it more deep, uh, uh, to make sure this is a uh, repeatable phenomenon. So we used even lithography to make ideal nano dots, uh, aluminum dots, and we coated with amorphous silicon. So we can see whether this is repeatable. So what we see here is uh, we, we can see the same you know, recovery phenomena. Also, if we run a scratch across the dots, you see the core uh, deformed very easily. And then by the core shell structure after a heavy scratch is still intact. So that's the, uh, also the friction is uh, very low core shell structure compared to the smooth surface. Um, and we also did uh, fatigue testing because one scratch is not enough for just to justify application. So we did uh, 50,000 cycles uh, indenting on, on the surface uh, with oscillate motion. And we don't see much you know, deformation after that, where the aluminum core only we see uh, deformation early on. Uh, so this is also applicable to the polymer core. Here is an AP dip. It's a, it's a uh, polymer that is used for 3D nanoprinting. And uh, we made core of different sizes and we placed uh, aluminum, alumina uh, coating, hard coating there. And what we see here, similar uh, phenomena with very high contact pressure, those core shell structure only deform a little bit. With, uh, this is also uh, 2,000 micronewton also is equivalent to high contact pressure. We don't see a lot of deformation. Um, but without the shell, uh, this core wouldn't stay on the surface because they, they can be scratched off. And this uh, load is equivalent to 20, more than 20 gigapascal. Uh, of course, this is also texture also reduced friction compared to smooth surface a lot. So that's an example of uh, applying coarse nano structure. It's it's uh, significant because of the uh, if you texture size is nano scale, any force will introduce a heavy uh, pressure because the size is small. Um, but with coarse arrangement, you can sustain very high contact pressure. So now let's move on to another uh, bio-inspired surface. This one is inspired by cartilage. You know, the cartilage 
that prevents the bone, direct bone, uh, bone, bone contact is has micro textures, natural micro textures. Those textures can store lubricants. So we studied different shape of the textures, uh, square shape, triangular, and also elliptical with different orientation to the sliding. What we found is that uh, of course, using the pendulum, uh, this is collaborating with another professor here. Uh, he has a pendulum hip simulator integrated with a chromatic uh, interval uh, gra gram, which means you can see the lubricant film through this transparent glass interface. You can see the film thickness uh, between the hip joint, the, the ball and socket, where with no dimple, you can see the film, the color, different color indicate different thickness. The thickness is very non-uniform, where textures uh, make the interface more, lubrication more uniform, especially the square shaped um, textures. Uh, if you look at the film thickness calculated based on those images, without texture, the film thickness is below 200 nan nanometers. And um, with texture, the square texture, especially the film thickness reaches 800 nanometers. So many times, four times uh, thicker than the, um, this um, no texture. And also, uh, if you look at the wear, uh, there is hardly any wear with the square shaped dimples uh, where you can see a little bit of wear here and there on the other textures. So that's the um, uh, laser textured dimples. Moving on to uh, the need of truly 3D texture, because um, like, like I mentioned, photolithography, they can make two and a half D structure, meaning they are 3D, but uh, the, the third direction, they don't have much control. So we call it two and a half D. Uh, what we are here, we hypothesize the truly 3D structure can actually be, uh, benefit from both friction and wear control uh, because if we can engineering a small surface tip area and uh, use a large base area, we can make this texture more, more mechanically strong and resist to uh, wear. Uh, but yet uh, still keep the low friction uh, because of the low surface area, uh, contact area. So we compare this uh, just the a cylinder with the same size of the tip and a cylinder with the same size of the base. We call this one two, two and a half D tip, this one two and a half D base. And we call this cone structure um, Cornical structure is 3D. Um, this is where I mentioned this 3D nano printing can actually play a big role here. It's an enabling technology for, for us to do to uh, texture any shape. So um, just explain a little bit of how this works. Uh, again, as I eluded, um, this this uh, based on two photon polymerization. Uh, meaning the polymerization open, uh, only happens at local area because of the two photon mechanism. Uh, it doesn't affect any other area. If we can use a laser to focus on a particular area, we can actually, it's just imagine it's like a pen, you draw 3D shape uh, in, in space. And that uh, uh, pen is a laser focal point. And we can use a variety of materials to do it as long as they can be polymerized uh, based on the two photon polymerization uh, principle. And, and the laser uh, shape, actually, we call it voxel. It's like a football with a 300 nanometer in a smaller dimension and 500 nanometer in a larger direction. So the voxel move around the 3D space to generate structure. Here we show the 3D printing in real case. Uh, with this, we can actually adjust our design 
and see the change uh, happening. Uh, quick turn turnaround time because, uh, yeah, the, the design can can be turned into uh, realization without any molding or any other requirement. So that's the uh, beauty of this technology is uh, you can evaluate different designs quickly. And so we use this technology to uh, make those 3D structures, like what I mentioned, uh, just a little bit more details. We have a substrate. We place a drop of uh, photoresist on the surface. And the laser focus through the high, high uh, magnification uh, optical objectives. And then that's this voxel point here, where, um, yeah, you can see this one. This moves around. You can program its path. So here we program it layer by layer, and and after it's it's uh, moved throughout, you form a uh, cone structure. Um, so as you can imagine, this may be too slow uh, because we are moving nano dots across the surface. So we we actually used molding technique once. We use 3D printing to print a masterpiece, and then we mold it. Uh, we duplicate very easily with uh, uh, soft lithography. Uh, we make multiple copies, and then we subject this texture surface uh, to friction test uh, with a counterface, silicon, flat silicon counterface. We use a digital camera to look at the side of the uh, testing to see how they slide against each other. Well, that's macro scale. At micro scale, we put this texture surface inside an SEM and use a diamond flat diamond uh, tip to run against it. And here uh, can show a little bit what we can see during sliding uh, in real time. Uh, what you can see, the thing is that this texture bent uh, and then you can see exactly what's going on with friction and uh, as it travels through uh, the sliding distance. Uh, this can help us explain what's going on with this kind of friction signature. So yeah, like, like I said, um, here, uh, this signature, if we don't have in situ observation, we don't know what to make of it, right? We don't know what's happened. How do we explain this part? But with the, the in situ, we can see, okay, here, uh, the first is loaded, and then uh, the structure is good. We resist, you now we have a little bit of friction, so we here, slight friction here increase. Uh, but then the, the structure suddenly buckles, so it bends. Uh, this gives the surface a push. It's actually resulting negative friction, uh, meaning it pushed to the, uh, the, the, the counterface to the same sliding direction. So that's why you see a negative slope. And then the push goes on until it's completely flattened, uh, where you see, because of the flatten, the contact area become much bigger than the beginning. So you see a friction increase. And then after that, it's just a constant friction. And then when you reverse your direction, it keeps the same friction, but in opposite direction. So with in situ, we can explain weird friction signals. Um, and here can help us explain what's happening in the macro scale testing too. Uh, in the macro scale friction test, you can see the bone structure uh, have a steady low friction where the, two, the 2D base structure also has more or less steady friction, but it's much higher because of the contact area is much higher than this uh, cone shape. Uh, but this uh, 2D tip structure at beginning started low uh, and then it become wild. That's because they bent and they, some of them got removed. Uh, if you look at the mac, uh, macro scale testing, you can see that Cone structure moves very smoothly, and but the 2D base structure, you can see kind of uh, they are uh, rocking. 
because of this diction, uh, especially two and a half D tip structure, because essentially with with the removal of those structures, you are running to smooth surface. So that's caused those behaviors. Uh, those, so those are the uh, uh, help of in situ testing and 3D printing here. Uh, with 3D printing, we can also uh, study other aspects. Like here, we were inspired by this frog's toe, where uh, they have this hexagonally arranged grooves, uh, main function is to help them um, squeeze out the liquid so that they can um, get hold of the surface. But we are borrowing it, we combine this grooves, have no, no grooves with dimples. And we study the, the uh, groove lens width and depths, and how does that affect the friction behavior. And we compare those textures with piston ring cross hatch. This one is duplicated from the real uh, piston ring. And we also have some like idealized piston ring uh, with cross hatch. Uh, what we found is that um, our best textures is 22% better than the flat one, but also 10% uh, better than the uh, duplicate of piston ring uh, during the test. Uh, so moving on to another, uh, bio-inspiration is uh, inspired by the sandfish, uh, the, the reptiles living in the sand. They normally, not only they have this hard scale, uh, and also they are very lubricious, they have low friction also. Um, a lot of times they look, the scale looks similar, uh, this, this is a scale that you can see from your naked eye, but if you blow it up, uh, you can see this baby like uh, microstructure, but also at its very tip, there actually has nano scallop. Of course, we cannot duplicate uh, exactly those nano scales, but we can do the micro scale things. Um, uh, even the height is nano scale here, uh, very, um, small scale features that is uh, from those scales. Uh, we can see those helps reduce friction and wear also, particularly they can control the, the, the crack propagation. With smooth textures, uh, you can have adhesive uh, wear, but also when under high load, they, they generate large cracks with textures, however, the, those tiny textures can actually restrict their uh, propagation. So that's uh, one of the mechanisms why they, they don't have large scale uh, crack formation. And uh, uh, moving on to lotus leaf uh, inspired surface. Uh, lotus leaf, many of you already probably know, they have micro nano uh, scale hierarchical structure texture surface. And they are self, they can self clean because uh, combined their topography with their waxy surface chemistry, they, uh, which give the lotus the low surface energy. Any debris or contaminants like to stick to the water uh, on the uh, surface. Um, and then when there is any vibration or any movement of the leaf, those water droplet will collect those uh, wear debris along the way and, and make it self-cleaning. Now here is a surface uh, mimicking lotus leaf and shows uh, where the, the droplets rolls off, it cleans the surface. So we want to uh, study how the hierarchical structure can help change the wettability and friction. So we compared a micro texture without any nano hairs, and short nano hairs and long nano hairs. We compare their friction and wettability. Uh, again, we use this two-photon polymerization uh, method to make 
the hierarchical structure, and then we study them inside uh, SEM. Uh, here we show that high water contact angle, like super hydrophobic surface, meaning when you drop a water on the surface, it forms a water contact angle of more than 150 degrees. The angle is between the, the horizontal line and the tangential uh, of this droplet. So this angle here, uh, we call it water contact angle. So 153.5 in this case for long hair. And for the short hair and the micro texture, they are similar. Um, it's below 150. So we only we can only call them hydrophobic surface. Um, but now here, what we want to emphasize is that even though long hair created a super hydrophobic surface, which is very desirable for, say, application in micro devices, because the stiction is an issue. If we have super hydrophobic surface, we can repair water or uh, moisture and then reduce friction, uh, reduce adhesion between parts. However, uh, those long hairs, like, uh, like we, we were studying here with a 2D structure here, they bend, right? They can bend, uh, which cause actually higher friction compared to short hair uh, and the different loads. Here is, and the different loads you can see here, the long hair compared to short hair, uh, and same here. So especially at high load, it tend to bend and causing um, a higher friction, and also they, they will lose their superhydrophobicity also. Of course, texture always had benefit in terms of reducing friction. Compared to no hair, uh, you can see drastic reduction in friction. So moving on to arbitrary surface, we said, what if now all those examples we gave so far, it has determined, uh, it has fixed shape and everything is the same, every texture is the same. But in nature, we found that they are not exactly the same. Uh, so they are more kind of random, but they have similar shape. Well, uh, if you take uh, any surface, we have figured out how to take any surface, uh, capture a high resolution image, and then be able to digitize the surface to be able to produce using two photon polymerization to produce duplicate of those surface. And then we can apply hard coating to uh, make it more durable because uh, those polymers are not necessarily durable. Uh, here, some examples of banana peels and also Eastern Wahoo uh, leaf here, uh, and also a random dust on, on, a, on a coin. Uh, what we show here is that uh, optical image and replicated image uh, and replicated surface are very similar. And we did some statistical analysis to show they are similar also. Uh, in another example, we actually duplicated banana surface and daffodil uh, leaves to test their tribological performance. Some of them we coated with hard coating as well based on uh, the fact that we need to in, in, in prove their durability. What we found the uh, daffodil paddle surface reduced friction actually 42% uh, in lubricated condition. And, and um, that's no, uh, very remarkable compared to all the improvement that we have seen with our textures, 20% or 10%. So nature has figured out a way to reduce friction very well. Uh, so to summarize, I've given you, you know, why surface topography is important, you know, why we need to inspire from nature and also uh, different types of surfaces. We fabricated it with uh, different techniques, lasers, 3D printing, and even uh, the rudimentary evaporation here we did in our first cautious study. But most promising one is a 3D nanoprinting. Uh, with that, we printed arbitrary surfaces as well as hierarchical surface and studied their tribological properties. And they uh, tend to give us more uh, 
flexibility in terms of what textures we can make, and also the quick turnaround time too. Um, so uh, with that, I'd like to um, acknowledge different funding agencies that has uh, have supported my research over the years, and also uh, my uh, past and current group members, as well as uh, my collaborators on, on the research presented here. And uh, thank you, everyone, for your attention. And uh, I'd like to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much for that fascinating presentation. Lots of uh, really interesting scenarios where we can take inspiration from nature. Uh, yeah. For now, let's, we're going to quickly swap to, uh, to Daniel Schultz's presentation from Data Physics, after, uh, after which we'll proceed to the Q&A. So uh, right now, I'd like to invite Daniel on stage. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Ian. OK, let me uh, bring your slides up, Daniel. Mm -hmm. OK. There we go. Please take it away. OK, perfect. Then, yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks, Lynn, for the nice presentation before. So now I have a very short presentation about yeah, data physics and our surface analyzing methods, mainly for contact angle measuring systems and a short part about theta potential measurements. So I mean, Min already had that in the presentation before. Measuring contact angles is a great way to yeah just qualify different surface treatments, different surface structures, just different materials in general. And basically, what you do there with our contact angle goniometers is you have different dosing systems for different drop volumes. You deposit a droplet or the solid substrate, and then with the optical system and a USB camera. You look from the side how yeah, how the droplet is uh, spreading over the surface if it's a hydrophilic or hydrophobic one and the software will find the droplet do the fitting and gives you the contact angle for that so that is yeah, a great way to just analyze everything in a really quick and easy way and also allows you from that to calculate surface energies so that you not only have the contact angle to compare over different surfaces but you can also see where the change is coming from. If you have a higher or lower surface energy, if the polar or the dispersive part changes. So you have a lot of different ways to analyze and just get more details about your surface and your treatments that you do. And what you're actually measuring is always the apparent contact angle. So basically, with the optical system and the camera, you will always see a flat surface and you will see how the droplet is spreading on that. But microscopically, you will have surface structures, you will have inhomogeneities. So your surface actually might have a different contact uh, three-phase point than you see. Commonly referred to, the apparent contact angle is the one that you are measuring and the one that you compare and usually use. But there are ways also in our software then to correct for the different roughness factors. And usually with large droplets spreading all over the surface, this isn't there too much of an issue. It's getting more interesting if you look at actual real surfaces with very small droplets. So for applications that you will have, it will always be beneficial if you use for your general measurements about the same drop size as you have in the real application at the end. And we have done there a cooperation with uh, David Wu from Coventry University just to uh, yeah, test the different effects and macroscopic and microscopic droplets on different surfaces. So that is a short yeah, part of that. And basically what we have done here is measuring contact angles with a conventional dosing system, meaning microliter droplets with syringes and needles, just put softly on a surface and measured the contact angle. And we also have done these contact angle measurements on the same surface using our, using our picoliter dosing system. Once microscopic, so dosing a lot of picoliter droplets to get a bigger droplet, 
and then also just dosing a single picoliter droplet, which is then about 20 picoliters in volume. And just to see if it makes a difference, how big the drop actually is. And as a reference there, there is the silicon waiver measurements. Silicon waivers are very smooth, very ideal, very homogeneous in terms of chemistry and uh, surface structure. And you see it basically doesn't matter which kind of dosing system and drop volume you use, you will always get the same contact angle on those. As a more extreme example to see the difference, there is also measurements on paper. And there you see basically a big drop gives you always a contact angle about 100 degree. But if you do a single uh, picoliter droplet on it, you will see a very, very different contact angle with that. And that is because of the roughness and the, yeah, the structure that the paper has just by its natural appearance. So that is a very good example to just show that it's important to uh, simulate your actual drop size if you're measuring contact angles and yeah, want to, to compare different treatments, different things. So that is one part about contact angles. So yeah, I said that's good to compare and get surface energy and compare those as well to just get a lot of that part of surface chemistry. But you can also do is measuring surface, uh, measuring theta potential of the surface, meaning basically the surface charge or how a, yeah, how a surface is charged when it's immersed into a liquid. So there are different ways to do that. It's basically a streaming current method and a streaming potential method where you, with our system, just flow liquid through the sample itself. So that is not for a colloidal system. This is for, uh, for solid surfaces like plates, fibers, and so on. And that will give you, besides the contact angle surface energy part, it will give you the charge of the surface. So you will also know a bit where the surface energy actually comes from in an electronic kind of way. So that is the instrument there. It has a bi-directional uh, flow. So that's a patented technology where you stream through the sample in both directions, which gives you several advantages that you can do a lot of statistical values by just yeah, oscillating for a longer time. You will have different pressure ramps all the time because of the changing oscillation. Just gives you a more reliable data and gives you information about the surface. And then you can also connect the liquid dosing system to this and vary the pH value of your solution that you're using. So basically you set everything up, you set a titration program, you start the measurement and it will oscillate through your sample doing measurements all the time, every once in a while, changing the pH value of the liquid that you're using, but still continue to measure and at the end, gives you the setup potential for that surface at all these different pH values so that you can very easily just get the isoelectric point of the surface. So basically the point at which pH value the surface is not electronically charged anymore. That just gives you more information on the surface than just measuring that single theta potential. And as said, we're using a patented bidirectional streaming method for that. So that means we have with every uh, cycle that you do, you will have different pressures depending on the point of in your, uh, in your synodal yeah, uh, oscillation. And we'll get a lot of statistical value out of that. Just making lots of measurements, streaming in both directions instead of only using one direction just gives you also the information if your surface itself is homogeneous or if yeah if there is some directional dependency on the results just gives you more information like that and then yeah in that combination contact angle surface energy theta potential isoelectric point you will just get a lot of information about a given surface that you can analyze compare and with different treatments surface effects and so on structures you can manipulate and 
go to in the direction of the service that you actually want to produce. So that was my very short presentation about data physics. <laughs> then thanks again for having me. Uh, lots of, uh, again, lots of great applications for- uh, oh. We cannot hear you, Sam. Oh, no. There we go. Are we back now? <laughs> Sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, now I can hear Excellent. you. Excellent. <laughs> Sorry. I was, uh, I was just saying, great, you know, I mean, thank you so much for your presentation. Great applications for both Zeta Potential and Contact Angle. Um, it's probably both of those techniques um, are likely underused, really, in uh, in um, in academia and industry. Uh, so now let's uh, proceed with the Q and A. So uh, if I could ask um, Dr. Min to come back on stage, please. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so we have a, a couple of questions from the audience, but before uh, I read out the first one, I would just like to uh, make the attendance certificate link available. Um, so for anyone who is clicking on that, please go ahead, open the tab. Um, the certificate's going to be, you'll be able to generate that for the next day. Don't close this down, come right back um, whilst we uh, go through the questions. So now we have a first one um, from Francisco here um for for you men um two two questions actually in this one the first of which is saying what what kind of texture um would reduce friction uh to a greater extent of those that you i believe of of those that you discussed today oh um it it's hard to say that it's hmm. it's a uh, let's say the microsphere is killer. Is mm. not as big. I think that we we did not did not directly compare different types. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, within our study, we compare with each other. Um, I I guess normally, if you have a dry friction, as I normally do, study is the smaller contact mm -hmm. area. If you can sustain the wear, it it's mm -hmm. the one that reduces the most. So we try to minimize the direct contact area between mm -hmm. the surfaces. Of course. And the the second part of the question asks, um, for microstructures such as pillars, uh, for example, the lotus leaf or micro dimples, could they be used as lubricant reservoirs? Yeah, yeah, as long as they have no recessed area. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, okay. Um, okay, we've got a second question here uh, from Abhineva. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Apologies if I have messed up that pronunciation. Uh, they ask, is it possible to engrave these microstructures onto soft polymers? And how would the friction and wear behavior change in dry conditions? In great, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the, I mean, uh, within 3D printing, it's different. We cannot use our 3D nano printing technique, mm -hmm. which is based on two photon polymerization uh, principle. But uh, laser, uh, I can uh, laser mm -hmm. can mm -hmm. be used to engrave uh, soft polymer. Uh, if you have low power laser, mm -hmm. you can do that. And no, the lubricate and unlubricate could be applicable to mm -hmm. uh, for the texture here. Yeah. Okay, got it. Thank you. Um, friction change. Okay, yeah, it will, so, will change because mm -hmm. of the lubrication. Yeah, I guess <laughs> the question. Yes, of course. That's um, I get you know for systems such as this where there's so many variables it's it's I, I would assume it's it's quite difficult to make generalized statements like this as the mm -hmm. the systems are, are almost just you know designed to to mimic very much the 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 environment that these structures would exist in in nature mm. okay um andreas has just asked would these will these slides be available so we will not be sharing the slides andreas but just so you know that there will be a an email sent around with a link to the recording and it will also be available on our website later okay so you will be able to view um 
view everything there. Um, so we have another few minutes before we are at our hour. So I will, uh, you know, keep the keep the floor open to questions for uh, uh, for a few minutes more. Please type any any questions you have uh, into the chat uh, before then. But for now, I think I, I would just like to ask, um, uh, Professor, do you feel that there are there are any um, biosystems? that we should look to in future to mimic and what kind of applications you think we can uh, we can target for you know using new biomimicked structures yeah i think the often studied one is is important mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. to continue to make those into real applications mm -hmm. we we have this lab studies but it's uh how do we make uh, them economically in mm -hmm. real applications? Yeah. That's, a, that's a big challenge. Yes. Um, and then, uh, of course, there are a lot of things. Uh, it's, it's hard to answer because of the nature has so vast mm -hmm. <laughs> collections that we don't know yet. Yes. Uh, I, I feel like if we can have a uh, more collaborations between biologists uh, mm -hmm. and uh, travelogists that would be open the uh, more opportunity it oftentimes we discover things by serendipity right mm -hmm. we happen to know uh, aware of certain things so i i don't know uh, i have a good answer to your <laughs> to your question <laughs> uh, yeah I... people study a variety of mm -hmm. uh, already in the literature, but I feel like no, there is more to explore mm. um, and also make them feasible yeah. into real applications. Yeah, I could say it's, let's say it's almost a good answer to almost say we should all, we should never stop looking, really, you know, <laughs> yeah. we'll, we never know when, uh, when further inspiration will, will strike. <laughs> mm. Okay, um, so we haven't had any further questions from the chat. So I think at this point, um, let's uh, draw the event to a close. So for anyone who would like the attendance certificate, I just want to, to highlight, please do go ahead and click that that link now so you can generate that for yourself. Uh, oh, sorry, before I begin, I wouldn't want to, to miss out any question. We just had one from, a, this will be the final one from uh, Francisco um who says thank you for your previous answer uh can micro pillars reduce friction more than micro dimples um micro pillars mm. yeah th those are again is based on the uh surface texture if mm. you if you have a dry contact depending on the surface no the top surface, the fraction of the surface, mm -hmm. whether it's dimple or or, or um, pillar, uh, surface texture definitely is a, a factor. And mm -hmm. also, you have to consider the durability too. Um, mm -hmm. If you have dimple, maybe better because you have connected structure versus dimp. Uh, I mean, pillar is isolated structure. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's that's sturdy uh, in a sense. Given the same contact no, area mm -hmm. and if the lubricate condition it's hard to say uh, because it uh, involves interactions mm -hmm. <laughs> between the <laughs> lubricant <laughs> where the speed and other things also play yeah. uh, absolutely thank you okay so with that so thank you uh francisco for that uh for that final question let's now wrap uh wrap the event up so i would just like to say thank you um very much, Mim, for the great presentation today. Um, yeah, truly, lots, lots to think about, and lots to, uh, lots to go and read as well on, um, on biomimicry, biotribology, um, and all of the the topics that you that you uh, covered today. Uh, thank you, Daniel, for your presentation, and thank you for the support from Data Physics. Uh, we wouldn't be able to run these events without uh, our partners. So, thank you very much for the uh, for the support. Uh, thank you to the audience for those questions. And as well, please don't forget to uh, visit our website, surfaceventures.org. Uh, you can see our latest event um, is 
now live and able to be registered for. It's on the 26th of October at 9 a.m. Uh, British Standard Time. Our website will be updated with that later. Uh, you can also uh, register to receive our newsletter, uh, Modern Surface. You can also check out our LinkedIn page where you will find links to all of these things there. Uh, on our website also, you can see all of our replays uh, from past events. So if you would like to view view any of our previous speakers, please look there. And so with that, uh, just one final message, which is please uh, do take the time to advertise our work um, to your colleagues, um, friends, anyone who may be interested. And I'd just like to say thank you very much for joining us today. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Goodbye. Yeah, thank you, Sam. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, everyone, Thanks, for your yeah, attention. Okay. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.